Stewart is an urban planner with a keen interest in how cities function and the health of the people that live in them. He has worked in roles spanning the public and consulting sectors in Melbourne, London and Perth, with a focus on developing transport and land use research, strategy and policy. Currently with RACV's public policy team, Stuart is looking into how Victoria is changing and how our world leading, your world leading livability can be enhanced. Thanks. Um, great to be here. Great lineup. Thank you all. I think I feel like I'm kind of bookending this little panel session with some content that really hits a note with what Ben started with. So mainly about protected infrastructure and where it should be in um, our great city, uh, Melbourne. So I'm going to start with the context that we're working in and why, why RACV are addressing this issue at all. Uh, so we've got about 1 point, uh, sorry, 2.1 million members in Victoria and they're a very diverse group. So they don't just drive their cars, they catch trains to work, they're on the trams, they're walking at the end of everything they do um, and a lot of them ride bikes. So we've got a fairly strong mandate from our membership to talk about this stuff. Um, it's not left field uh, and we certainly don't consider ourselves to be the motoring lobby anymore. Um, so that's the first point. The second there is that we feel like the state government um, has a really significant role to play in building a safe, um, a safe city to ride a bike in. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of great things going on at the sort of grassroots local council levels. Um, our advocacy in this particular project has been on the state and their role. And the third box there is just talking about data and evidence. Um, we think that's going to do a lot more benefit than anecdotes and stories that, that might be really emotional and pulling. Um, let's strip back, go back to the science and look at what, uh, what really matters and see what can move the needle in terms of cycling. So the state of play at the moment in, in our state is, it looks a little bit like this. So you've got a really, um, quite an aspirational network that's been charted out and it's kind of been charted out for a while now. Um, this is called the Strategic Cycling Corridors, as was defined in 2017. Uh, there's another bunch of lines that would come onto this map if we talked about the Principal Bicycle Network, uh, the PBN. And uh, I feel like I've been in rooms for 15 years talking about this stuff. Um, a lot of you have been talking about it for a lot longer. And uh, really little actually happening. Um, so little bits and pieces which are fantastic getting built and we kind of see the benefit and they're catalysts for other things. But in terms of achieving a network and seeing a really solid pipeline of projects that would achieve that aspirational network, I feel like that's been quite lacking. Um, the Victorian Cycling Strategy is an excellent uh, document and there it is uh, thanks to what, a couple of years ago now. And then just a, an example of a couple of local government um, documents that are quite progressive in their nature. Other cities are doing things a little bit differently to what we are. So this is London and this is a map they produced in 2009. So it's quite a stark difference to the map that we've seen about Melbourne, um, which has got um, thousands of kilometres of, of bike routes on it and it's extremely aspirational. This, ha this map has 12 lines on it um, and there's, back in 2009 there was two red ones which were their trial cycling superhighways and I feel like the message here is that they really focused their attention. Um, they didn't go out and try and achieve that extremely complex network. They picked 12 and I'm pretty sure most of these have been built now. If not, the, the concepts have been really well thought out and thought through. Um, so it's a very different approach. Why is that a good thing? They're getting some really different results to what we're getting. So um, the bottom left there, sorry, on the left is 
a, a just a massive increase in cycling participation in central London. Uh, I'm not suggesting this is all because of the infrastructure that they've built. They in this time period they've seen a congestion charge implemented. Uh, they had an Olympics. Uh, there's been a few other things happen. But you can see on the right there the types of infrastructure that they're building. Um, this is what I kind of think of as tier one excellent infrastructure. Um, the sort of stuff that you'd be quite happy to be in with your three-year-old. Uh, you know, you're protected, as Ben referred to earlier, that's where um, you're going to see significant increases in use. And for this reason, so we know this. Uh, this is local research from the city of Melbourne, I think. Um, protected bicycle infrastructure will achieve um, far greater use purely because people are more confident in it. Um, you're not getting hit by a car, you're not in a car door lane, all that sort of thing. So how can we point RACV in this whole direction? We came up with a really basic uh, research question. Uh, being what are Melbourne's trunk cycling corridors. So think about that London map. What are our, what 12 do we really care about? And what 12 should we really be focusing on? Um, we put this question out to the market um, and a few excellent consultants got back to us. One of the best in town was Cam Munro. Um, he wrote an excellent brief, got the job and was commissioned to sort of help us fill out or answer this question. So I'm sure you all know Cam. If you've got a query about anything here, he's just sitting over there. Um, so really fundamentally, we, we're we talking about more than a, a bit of paint on the road. So um, this is St Kilda Road. I've been um, battling this stretch of um, pavement since I was 19 when I moved up to the big smoke from Trafalgar. And uh, it still looks like that. I took that photo about a month ago. So. Um, this, this corridor has been in every bike plan and every kind of PBN or strategic cycling corridor for a very long time. Um, so our question is why, isn't th why aren't things like this being built um, a, lot, a lot sooner? So the basic method that um, Cam came up with was to take this strategic cycling corridor um, network um, so that we all kind of agree with and just essentially throw a lot of data at it and see what bubbles to the top in terms of what the priorities should be. So um, available data, we, we had a fairly short time frame for this project and not a huge budget. So we're talking weeks, not months. And um, so it's publicly, public data coming up with an attribute sort of table. I'm sure engineers here love multi-criteria analysis type things. You're, you're about to see a really good one. Um, scaling and just sort of coming up with a, a ranking for what the priorities should be for investment and essentially see what happens. So no bias, um, no anecdotes, just purely what the data is telling us. Um, and this is what it looks like. So this is in our report that uh, you're more than welcome to dig into the details of. What it's showing you is um, a whole heap of attributes and then on the right column, a, just a sum of, um, of the attributes and their weighting. So the top of this list is a street called Chapel Street uh, in South Yarra. It gets to the top of this list because it is a fairly, oh, it's extremely unsafe for riding a bike on. It's seen um, the most crashes per kilometre per year of all, the, of all the corridors that we looked at. Uh, and I'm sure it's not a surprise for any sort of professional in the room that sees a street like Chapel Street get to the top of a list like this. Uh, it's a very intuitive uh, read. You've got other streets there such as St Kilda Road, um, Sydney Road up to the north. Um, there's a whole heap more. When they're on a map, they look like this. And it's really not surprising that they're all focused on the, the central 10 kilometres of Melbourne. So. Those attributes I just spoke about refer to where people live and where they work, where the crashes are occurring. Um, Central Melbourne has this huge pulling power. You know, it's, it's an extremely successful urban centre, uh, especially in terms of jobs, um, increasing residential density since the 80s, I guess. Um, it's reflected here because these are the corridors that matter the most sort of in metropolitan Melbourne. So. 
Um, they span, I think they span about 10 kilometres um, sort of each way. The London map that we showed just before is, goes about 15 k's out of town. So it's not far off, it's, it's uh, really kind of, it is fairly intuitive what it's reading. More than happy to dig into any of this at any stage with any of you. The next steps for our work in this space um, are really just trying to push beyond this analysis mode and looking for what action might be achievable. So, um, as I said, these have been corridors that have been locked into policy documents for a very long time. Um, we're seeing signs of improvement, Dynan Roads being invested in, Footscray Roads getting this uh, Westgate Tunnel infrastructure, albeit very um, extreme, if you like. You got to use your bell. There you go. You're welcome. Um, yeah, I, I keep going back to Sydney Road, Chapel Street, St Kilda Road. These are a bit harder than those quite, um, especially Chapel, it's, it's a really hard thing to get right. So what we're asking for here is it to be looked at and for it to be taken seriously and for it to be sort of put into a pipeline of, of projects that um, can sort of fill out that core network. Once we get that right, then maybe we can move on to the next steps. Um, we think we've got a pretty special role to play in working with the corporate sector. So we'll look to do that over the next year or so. Uh, and obviously a big role that we play is with the media and with um, the elected uh, officials. Um, so we'll just try and keep that up and sort of look for action on all of this. Um, there's my details. Thanks, Stephen. That was great. <laughs>